Home Thoughts from the Sea by R. Browning. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Nobly, nobly Cape St. Vincent to the northwest died away. Sunset ran, one glorious blood red reeking into Cadiz Bay. Bluish mid the burning water, full in face Trafalgar lay. In the dimmest northeast distance dawned Gibraltar, grand and gray. Here and here did England help me. How can I help England? Say, whoso turns as I, this evening turn to God to praise and pray, while Jove's planet rises yonder, silent over Africa. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gibraltar by R. C. Trench Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. England, we love thee better than we know, And this I learned when, after wanderings long, Mid people of another stock and tongue, I heard again thy martial music blow, And saw thy gallant children to and fro, Pace, keeping ward at one of those huge gates, which like twin giants watch the Herculean straits. When first I came in sight of that brave show, it made the very heart within me dance, to think that thou thy proud foot shouldst advance forward so far into the mighty sea. Joy was it, an exultation to behold, thine ancient standards rich in blazonry, a glorious picture by the wind unrolled. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gibraltar by W. S. Blunt. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Seven weeks of sea, and twice seven days of storm upon the huge Atlantic and once more we ride into still water and the calm of a sweet evening screened by either shore of spain and barbary our toils are o'er our exile is accomplished once again we look on europe mistress as of yore of the fair earth and of the hearts of men ay this is the famed rock which hercules and goth and moor bequeathed us at this door england stands sentry god to hear the shrill sweet treble of her fifes upon the breeze and at the summons of the rock's guns roar to see her redcoats marching from the hill end of poem this recording is in the public domain from the scholar gypsy by m arnold Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Then fly our greetings, fly our speech and smiles, As some grave Tyranian trader from the sea Decried at sunset an emerging prow, Lifting the cool-haired creepers stealthily, The fringes of a southward-facing brow, Among the Aegean isles, and saw the merry Grecian coaster come, freighted with amber grapes and Cheyenne wine, green bursting figs and tunny steeped in brine, and knew the intruders on his ancient home. The young, light-hearted masters of the waves. And snatched his rudder and shook out more sail, and day and night held on indignantly, o'er the blue midnight waters with the gale, Betwixt the seards and soft Sicily, to where the Atlantic raves, outside the western straits and unbent sails, there, where down cloudy cliffs, through sheets of foam, shy traffickers, the dark Iberians come, and on the beach undid his corded bales. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Farewell to Malta by Lord Byron. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Adieu, ye joys of La Valette. Adieu, Sirocco, sun and sweat. Adieu, thou palace rarely entered. Adieu, ye mansions where I ventured. Adieu, ye cursed streets of stairs. How surely he who mounts you swears. Adieu, ye merchants often failing. Adieu, thou mob for ever railing. Adieu, ye packets without letters. Adieu, ye fools who ape your betters. Adieu, thou damps quarantine that gave me fever and the spleen. Adieu, that stage which makes us yawn, sirs. Adieu, his excellency's dancers. Adieu to Peter, whom no faults in but could not teach a colonel waltzing. Adieu, ye females fraught with graces. Adieu, red coats and redder faces. Adieu, the supercilious air of all that strut and militaire. I go, but God knows when or why, to smoky towns and cloudy sky. Two things, the honest truth to say, as bad, but in a different way. Farewell to these, but not adieu, triumphant sons of truest blue, while either Adriatic shore, and fallen chiefs, and fleets no more, and nightly smiles, and daily dinners, proclaim you war and woman's winners. Pardon my muse, whose apt to prate is, and take my rhyme, because tis gratis. And now, O Malta, since thou got us, thou little military hothouse, I'll not offend with words uncivil, and wish thee rudely at the devil, but only stare from out my casement, and ask, for what is such a place meant? Then in my solitary nook, return to scribbling, or a book, or take my physic while I'm able, two spoonfuls hourly by the label. Prefer my nightcap to my beaver, and bless the gods, I've got a fever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Edward Lear on his travels in Greece by Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver B.C. Ilian woodlands, echoing falls, of water, sheets of summer glass, the long divine Panician pass, the vast Acrocyrenian walls, Homerhit, Athos, all things fair, with such a pencil, such a pen, you shadow forth to distant men. I read and felt that I was there, and trust me while I turn the page and track you still on classic ground. I grew in gladness till I found my spirits in the golden age. For me the torrent ever poured, and glistened here and there alone, the broad-limbed gods at random thrown, by fountain urns and maids oared. A glimmering shoulder under gloom of cavern pillars on the swell, the silver lily heaved and fell, and many a slope was rich in bloom. From him that on the mountain lee, my dancing rivulets fed his flocks, to him who sat upon the rocks and fluted to the morning sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hellas by Sir Reynold Rod. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. It is not only that the sun loves best these southern lands. It is not for the trophies won of old by hero hands that nature wreathed in softer smiles was here the bride of art. A closer kinship claims these isles, the love land of the heart. It is because the poet's dream still haunts each happy vale that peopled every grove and stream to fit his fairy tale. There may be greener vales and hills, less bare to shelter man, 
but still they want the neighed rills and miss the pipe of pan there may be other isles as fair and summer seas as blue but then odysseus touched not there nor argo beached her crew the narid haunted river shore the fawn frequented dell possessed me with their magic more than sites where caesars fell and where the blooms of Zante blow their incense to the wave, when Ithaca dark headlands show the legendary cave, where in the deep of olive groves the summer hardly dies, where fair Phoenicia's sun-brown maids still keep their siren eyes, where Shalis strains with loving lips towards the little bay, the strand that held the thousand ships of Aulis of delay where otia ridge of granite bars the gate thermolope where huge orion crowned with stars looks down on rhodope where once apollo tended flocks on pharaoh's lofty plain where Phoenus cleaves the stubborn rocks to find the outer main where argos and mycenae sleep with all the buried wong and where Arcadian uplands keep the, the antique shepherd song. There is a spirit haunts the place all other lands must lack, a speaking voice, a living grace that beckons fancy back. Dear isles and sea indented shore, till songs be no more sung, the singers that have gone before will keep your lovers young and men will hymn your haunted skies and seek your holy streams until the soul of music dies and earth has done with dreams end of poem this recording is in the public domain the violet crown by sir reynold rod read for LibriVox.org by linda marie nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Wherefore the city of the violet crown? One asked me as the April sun went down behind the shadows of the Persian's mound, the fretted crags of Salamis. Look round and see the question answered, for we were upon the summit of that battled square, the rock of ruin in whose fallen shrine the world still worships what man made divine the maiden fane that yet may boast the birth of half the immortalities of earth the last rays light the portal a gold wave runs up the columns to the architrave lingers about the gable and is gone parnes hymetius and pentacolon show shadowy violet in the after rose Sitatheron's ridge and all the islands close the mountains ring like sapphires o'er the sea and from this circle's heart arthurily springs the white altar of the land's renown a marble lily in a violet crown and fairer crown had never a queen than this that grids thee round far famed acropolis so of these isles these mountains and the sea i wove a crown of song to dedicate to thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain athens by percy bysshe shelley read for LibriVox.org by eva davis athens the nodding promontories and blue isles and cloud-like mountains and dividuous waves of greece basked glorious in the open smiles of favoring heaven from their enchanted caves prophetic echoes flung dim melody on the unapprehensive wild the vine the corn the olive wild grew savage yet to human use unreconciled and like unfolded flowers beneath the sea like the man's thought dark in the infant's brain like aught that is which wraps what is to be 
Art's deathless streams lay veiled by many a vein of Parian stone. And yet a speechless child, verse murmured, and philosophy did strain her lidless eyes for thee. When o'er the Aegean main Athens arose, a city such as vision builds from the purple crags and silver towers of battlemented cloud, as in derision of kingliest masonry, the ocean floors pave it, the evening sky pavilions it, its portals are inhabited by thunder zoned winds, each head within its cloudy wings with sunfire garlanded, a divine work. Athens, diviner yet, gleamed with its crest of columns on the will of man as on a mount of diamonds set. For thou wert, and thine all creative skill peopled with forms that mock the eternal dead in marble immortality, that hill which was thine earliest throne and latest oracle. Within the surface of time's fleeting river, its wrinkled image lies, as then it lay, immovably unquiet, and forever it trembles, but it cannot pass away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Parnassus by Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Neba Parnassus O oh, thou Parnassus, whom I now survey, Not in the frenzy of a dreamer's eye, Not in the fabled landscape of a lay, But soaring snow-clad through thy native sky, In the wild pomp of mountain majesty, what marvel if i thus essay to sing the humblest of thy pilgrims passing by would gladly woo thine echoes with his string though from thy heights no more one muse will have her wing oft have i dreamed of thee whose glorious name who knows not knows not man's divinest lore and now i view thee tis at last with shame that I, in feeblest accents, must adore. When I recount thy worshippers of yore, I tremble, and can only bend the knee, nor raise my voice, nor vainly dare to soar, but gaze beneath thy cloudy canopy, in silent joy, to think at last I look on thee. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Corinth by Lord Byron, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Many a vanished year and age, and tempest's breath, and battle's rage have swept o'er Corinth, yet she stands, a fortress formed to freedom's hands. The whirlwind's wrath, the earthquake's shock, have left untouched her hoary rock. The keystone of land, which still, though fallen, looks proudly on that hill, the landmark to the double tide that purply rolls on either side as if their waters chafed to meet yet pause and crouch beneath her feet but could the blood before her shed since first timoleon's brother bled or baffled persia's despot fled arise from out the earth which drank the stream of slaughter as it sank that sanguine ocean would o'erflow her isthmus idly spread below or could the bones of all the slain who perished there be piled again that rival pyramid would rise more mounted like through those clear skies than yon tower capped acropolis which seems the very clouds to kiss end of poem this recording is in the public domain Karina to tangra by w s landor Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. From Athens Tangra, I think not I forget Thy beautifully storied streets Be sure my memory bathes yet In clear Thermodon and yet greets The blithe and liberal shepherd boy 
whose sunny bosom swells with joy when we accept his matted rushes upheaved with sylvan fruit away he bounds and blushes a gift i promise one i see which thou with transport wilt receive the only proper gift for thee of which no mortal shall be rave in later times thy mouldering walls until the last old turret falls a crown a crown from athens won a crown no god can wear beside latona's son there may be cities who refuse to their own child the honors due and look ungently on the muse but ever shall those cities rue the dry unyielding niggard breast offering no nourishment no rest to that young head which soon shall rise disdainfully in might and glory to the skies sweetly where caverned dearest flows do white armed maidens chant my lay flapping the while with laurel rose the honey gathering tribes away and sweetly sweetly attic tongues lisp your corinna's early songs to her with feet more graceful come the verses that have dwelt in kindred breasts at home O oh, let thy children lean aslant against the tender mother's knee and gaze into her face and want to know what magic there can be in words that urge some eyes to dance while others as in holy trance look up to heaven be such my praise why linger i must haste or lose the delphic bays end of poem this recording is in the public domain Wearing by R. Browning, read for LibriVox.org, by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. What's become of Waring, since he gave us all the slip? Choose land travel or seafaring, boots and chest or staff and scrip, rather than pace up and down any longer London town. Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory is departed travels wearing east away who of knowledge by hearsay reports a man upstarted somewhere as a god hordes grown european hearted millions of the wild made tame on a sudden at his fame in vishu land what avatar or who in moscow toward the Tsar, with the demurest of footfalls over the Kremlin's pavement bright, with serpentine and cyanite, steps with five other generals that simultaneously take snuff, for each to have pretext enough to kerchief wise unfold his sash, which softness self is yet the snuff, to hold fast where a steel chain snaps and leave the grand white neck no gash wearing in moscow to these rough cold northern natures born perhaps like the lamb white maiden dear from the circle of mute kings unable to repass the tear each as his sceptre down he flings to diane's fane at Tauritia, where now a captive priestess she alway mingles her tender grave hellenic speech with theirs tuned to the hailstone beaten beach as pours some pigeon from the murray lands wrapped by the world blast to fierce scythian strands where breed the swallows her melodious cry amid the barbarous twitter in russia never spain were fitter a most likely tis in spain that we and warring meet again now while he turns down that cool narrow lane into the blackness out of grave madrid 
all fire and shine, abrupt as when there slid its stiff gold blazing pall from some black coffin lid. Where I last saw Waring, how I'll turn to him who spoke. You saw Waring, truth or joke, inland travel or seafaring. We were sailing by Trieste, where a day or two we harbored. A sunset was in the west. When looking over the vessel's side, one of our company espied a sudden speck to larboard, and as a sea duck flies and swims, at once so came the light craft up, with its sole lanteen sail that trims, and turns the water round its rims, dancing as round a sinking cup, and by us like a fish it curled, and drew itself up close beside, its great sail on the instant furled, and o'er its planks a shrill voice cried, a neck as bronzed as a lascar's. Buy wine of us, you English brig, or fruit, tobacco, and cigars, a pilot for you to treast, without one look you'll ne'er so big they'll never let you up the bay we natives should know best i turned and just those fellows way our captain said the longshore thieves are laughing at us in their sleeves in truth the boy leaned laughing back and one half hidden by his side under the furled sail soon i spied with great grass hat and kerchief black who looked up with his kingly throat said somewhat while the other shook his hair back from his eyes to look their longest at us then the boat i know not how turned sharply round laying her whole side on the sea as a leaping fish does from the lee into the weather cut somehow her sparkling path beneath our bow and so went off as with a bound into the rosy and golden half of the sky to overtake the sun and reach the shore like the sea calf its singing cave yet i caught one glance her away the boat quite past and neither time nor toil could mar those features so i saw the last of warring you o oh, never star was lost here but it rose afar look east where whole new thousands are in vishu land what avatar end of poem this recording is in the public domain On the Rhine by M. Arnold. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen. Vancouver, B.C. Vain is the effort to forget. Some day I shall be cold, I know, as is the eternal moonlit snow of the high Alps to which I go. But ah, not yet, not yet. Vain is the agony of grief. Tis true, indeed, an iron knot. Tie straightly up from mine thy lot. And were it snapped, thou lovest me not. But is despair relief? A while let me with thought have done. And as this brimmed unwrinkled rhine, And that far purple mountain line, Lie sweetly in the look divine, of the slow sinking sun so let me lie and calm as they let beam upon my inward view those eyes of deep soft lucent hue eyes too expressive to be blue too lovely to be gray all quiet all things feel thy balm those blue hills too this river's flow 
were restless once but long ago tamed is their turbulent youthful glow their joy is in their calm end of poem this recording is in the public domain the castled crag of drachenfels by lord byron read for LibriVox.org by nemo the castled crag of drachenfels the castled crag of drachenfels frowns o'er the wide and winding rhine whose breast of waters broadly swells between the banks which bear the vine in hills all rich with blossomed trees in fields which promise corn and wine in scattered cities crowning these whose far white walls along them shine have strewed a scene which i should see with double joy wert thou with me and peasant girls with deep blue eyes and hands which offer early flowers walk smiling o'er this paradise above the frequent feudal towers through green leaves lift their walls of grey and many a rock which steeply lowers in noble arch and proud decay looks o'er this vale of vintage bowers but one thing want these banks of rhine thy gentle hand to clasp in mine i send the lilies given to me though long before thy hand they touch i know that they must withered be but yet reject them not as such for i have cherished them as dear because they yet may meet thine eye and guide thy soul to mine even here when thou beholdst them drooping nigh and know'st them gathered by the rhine and offered from my heart to thine the river nobly foams and flows the charm of this enchanted ground in all its thousand turns disclose some fresher beauty varying round the haughtiest breast its wish might bound through life to dwell delighted here nor could on earth a spot be found to nature and to me so dear could thy dear eyes and following mine still sweeten more these banks of rhine and a poem this recording is in the public domain Up the Rhine by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person Up the Rhine Why, tourist, why, with passport have to do? Prithee stay at home and pass the port and sherry too. Why, tourist, why, embark for Rotterdam? Prithee stay at home and take thy Hollands in a dram. Why, tourist, why, to foreign climes repair? Prithee take thy German flute and breathe the German air. Why, tourist, why, the seven mountains view? Any one at home can tint a hill with Prussian blue. Why, tourist, why, to old Colonia's walls? Sure to see a Rhenish dome, one needn't leave St. Paul's. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cologne by S. T. Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. In Colm, a town of monks and bones, and pavements fanged with murderous stones, and rags and hags and hideous wenches, I counted two and seventy stenches, all well defined and several stinks. Ye nymphs that reign o'er sewers and sinks, the river Rhine is well known doth wash your city of cologne but tell me nymphs what power divine shall henceforth wash the river rhine end of poem this recording is in the public domain the pursuit of letters by thomas hood read for librivox.org by recording person the pursuit of letters the germans for learning enjoy great repute but the english make letters still more a pursuit for a cockney will go from the banks of the thames to cologne for an o and to nassau for m's end of poem this recording is in the public domain
From Dover to Munich by C. S. Calverley. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Farewell, farewell, before our prow leaps in white foam the noisy channel. A tourist cap is on my brow, my legs are cased in tourist flannel. Around me gasp the invalids, the quantity to night is fearful. I take a brace or so of weeds and feel as yet extremely cheerful. The night wears on, my thirst I quench with one imperial pint of porter, then drop upon a casual bench. The bench is short, but I am shorter. Place neath my head the haversack, which I have stored my little all in, and sleep, though moist about the back, serenely in an old tarpaulin. Bed at Ostin at 5 a.m., breakfast at 6 and train 6.30, Tickets to coins winter, mem, the seats objectionably dirty. And onward through those dreary flats we move with scanty space to sit on, flanked by stout girls with steeple hats and waists that paralyze a Briton, by many a tidy little town, where tidy little frows sit knitting. The men's pursuits are lying down smoking perennial pipes and spitting, and doze and excreate the heat, and wonder how far off Cologne is, and if we shall get aught to eat, till we get there, save raw Polonies, until at last the gray old pile is seen, is passed, and three hours later, we're ordering steaks and talking vile, mock German to an Austrian waiter. On, on the vessel steals, round go the paddle wheels, and now the tourist feels as he should. For king like rolls the Rhine, and the scenery's divine, and the victuals and the wine rather good. From every crake will passel, rise up some hoar old castle, the hanging fir grows tassel every slope, and the vine her lithe arm stretches, or peasants singing catches, and you'll make no end of sketches, I should hope. We've a nun here, called Therese, two couriers out of place, one Yankee with a face, like a ferret's, and three youths in scarlet caps, drinking chocolate and snaps, a diet which perhaps has its merits. And day again declines, in shadow sleep the vines, and the last ray through the pines feebly glows, and sinks behind yon ridge, and the usual evening midge is settling on the bridge of my nose, and keens the air and cold, and the sheep are in the fold, and night walks sable stoled through the trees, and on the silent river the floating starbeams quiver, and now the saints deliver us from fleas. Avenues of broad white houses, basking in the noontide glare, streets which foot of traveler shrinks from, as on hot plates shrinks the bear. Elsewhere lawns and vista gardens, statues white and cool arcades, where at eve the German warrior winks upon the German maids. Such is Munich, broad and stately, rich of hue and fair of form, but towards the end of August, unequivocally warm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nuremberg by H. W. Longfellow. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. In the valley of the Pegnese, where across broad meadow lands rise the blue Franconian mountains, Nuremberg, 
the ancient stands. Quaint old town of toil and traffic, quaint old town of art and song, memories haunt thy pointed gables, like the rooks that round them throng. Memories of the Middle Ages, when the emperors, rough and bold, had their dwelling in thy castle, time defying centuries old. And thy brave and thrifty burghers boasted in their uncouth rhyme that their great imperial city stretched its hand through every clime. In the courtyard of the castle, bound with many an iron band, stands the mighty linden planted by Queen Cunningood's hand. On the square the oriel window, where in old heroic days sat the poet Melanchor singing Kaiser Macmillan's praise. Everywhere I see around me rise the wondrous world of art, fountains wrought with richest sculpture standing in the common mart. And above cathedral doorways, saints and bishops carved in stone, by a former age commissioned as apostles to our own. In the church of sainted Sebald sleeps enshrined his holy dust, and in bronze the twelve apostles guard from age to age their trust. In the church of sainted Lawrence stands a pix of sculptured rare, like the foamy sheath of fountains rising through the painted air. Here when art was still religion, with a simple reverent heart, lived and labored Albrecht Durer, the evangelist of art. Hence in silence and in sorrow, toiling still with busy hand, like an emigrant he wandered, seeking for the better land. Emmy Gravit is the inscription on the tombstone where he lies. Dead he is not, but departed, for the artist never dies. Fairer seems the ancient city, and the sunshine seems more fair, that he once had trod its pavement, that he once had breathed its air. Through these streets so broad and stately, these obscure and dismal lanes, walked of yore the master singers, chanting rude poetic strains. From remote and sunless suburbs came they to the friendly guild, building nests in fame's great temple, as in spouts the swallows build. As the weaver plied the shuttle, wove he to the mystic rhyme, and the smith his iron measures hammered to the anvil's chime. Thanking God whose boundless wisdom makes the flowers of posy bloom, in the forges dust and cinders in the tissues of the loom here hans socks the cobbler poet laureate of the gentle craft wisest of the twelve wise masters in huge folios sang and laughed but his house is now an alehouse with a nicely sanded floor and a garland in the window and his face above the door painted by some humble artist as in adam pushman's song as the old man gray and dove-light with his great beard white and long and at night the swart mechanic comes to drown his cark and care quaffing ale from pewter tankards in the master's antique chair vanished is the ancient splendor and before my dreamy eye wave these mingled shapes and figures like a faded tapestry. Not thy counsels, not thy kaisers, win for thee the world's regard, but thy painter Albrecht Dewar, and Hans Sock, thy cobbler bard. Thus, O Nuremberg, a wanderer from a region far away, as he paced thy streets and courtyards, sang in thought his careless lay, gathering from the pavement's crevice as a floweret of the soil, the nobility of labor, the long pedigree of toil. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Aged Cities by Frederick William Faber Read for LibriVox.org by William Demick Aged Cities I have known cities with the strong-armed Rhine Clasping their mouldered quays in lordly sweep, And lingered where the main's low waters shine Through Tyrian Frankfort, And been fain to weep made the green cliffs Where pale Mosella laves that Roman sepulchre Imperial Trave. Ghent boasts her street, and Bruges her moonlight square, and holy Mechlin, Rome of Flanders, stands like a queen mother on her spacious lands, and Antwerp shoots her glowing spire in air. Yet have I seen no place, by inland brook, hilltop, or plain, or trim arcaded bowers, that carries age so nobly in its look as Oxford with the sun upon her towers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bruges by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. The spirit of antiquity, enshrined in sumptuous buildings, vocal in sweet song, in picture speaking with heroic tongue and with devout solemnities entwined mounts to the seat of grace within the mind hence forms that glide with swan-like ease along hence motions even amid the vulgar throng to an harmonious decency confined as if the streets were consecrated ground the city one vast temple dedicate to mutual respect in thought and deed, to leisure, to forbearances sedate, to social cares from jarring passions freed, a deeper peace than that in deserts found. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Belfry of Bruges by H. W. Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. In the marketplace of Bruges Stands the belfry old and brown Thrice consumed and thrice rebuilded Still it watches o'er the town As the summer morn was breaking On that lofty tower I stood And the world threw off the darkness like the weeds of widowhood, thick with towns and hamlets studded, and with streams and vapours grey, like a shield embossed with silver, round and vast the landscape lay. At my feet the city slumbered, from its chimneys here and there, wreaths of snow-white smoke ascending, vanished ghost-like into air. Not a sound rose from the city at that early morning hour, but I heard a heart of iron beating in the ancient tower. From the nest beneath the rafter sang the swallows wild and high, and the world beneath me sleeping seemed more distant than the sky. Then most musical and solemn, bringing back the olden times, with their strangely unearthly changes rang the melancholy chimes. Like the psalms from some old cloister when the nuns sing in the choir and the great bell tolled among them like the chanting of a friar visions of the days departed shadowy phantoms filled my brain they who live in history only seem to walk the earth again all the foresters of flanders mighty baldwin brought de fair lyric de Buc, and Cressy Philip, Guy de Dampierre. I beheld the pageant splendid that adorned these days of old, stately dames like queens attended, knights who bore the fleece of gold, Lombard and Venetian merchants with deep-laden argosies, ministers from twenty nations, more than royal pomp and ease. I beheld proud Maximilian, kneeling humbly on the ground. I beheld the gentle Mary, hunting with her hawk and hound. 
and her lighted bridal chamber where a duke slept with the queen and the armed guard around them and the sword unsheathed between i beheld the flemish weavers with namur and juliers bold marching homeward from the bloody battle of the spurs of gold saw the fight at many water saw the white hoods moving west saw the great artveld victorious scale the golden dragon's nest and again the whiskered spaniard all the land with terror smote and again the wild alarm sounded from the toscan's throat till the bell of ghent responded o'er lagoon and dyke of sand i am roland i am roland there is victory in the land then the sound of drums aroused me the awakened city's roar chased the phantoms i had summoned back into their graves once more hours had passed away like minutes and before i was aware lo the shadow of the belfry crossed the sun illuminated square end of poem this recording is in the public domain the carillon by d g rossetti read for LibriVox.org by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c antwerp and bruges at antwerp there is a low wall binding the city and a moat beneath that the wind keeps afloat you pass the gates in a slow drawl of wheels if it is warm at all the carillon will give you thought i climb the stair in antwerp church what time the urgent weight of sound at sunset seems to heave it round far up the carillon did search the wind and the birds came to perch far under where the gables wound in antwerp harbor on the scheldt i stood along a certain space of night the mist was near my face deep on the flow was heard and felt the carillon kept pause and dwelt in music through the silent place at bruges when you leave the train a singing numbness in your ears the carillon's first sound appears only the inner moil again a little minute though your brain takes quiet and the whole sense hears john memling and john van eyck hold state at bruges in sore shame i scan the works that keep their name the carillon which then did strike mine ears was heard of theirs alike it set me closer unto them i climbed at bruges all the flight the belfry has of ancient stone for leagues i saw the east wind blown the earth was gray the sky was white i stood so near upon the height that my flesh left the carillon end of poem this recording is in the public domain Holland by Andrew Marvel Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Holland, that scarce deserves the name of land, As but the off-scouring of the British sand, And so much earth as was contributed By English pilots when they heave the lead, Or what by the ocean's slow alluvion fell, of shipwreck cockle and the mussel shell this indigested vomit of the sea fell to the dutch by just propriety glad then as miners who have found the ore they with mad labor fished the land to shore and dived as desperately for each piece of earth as if it had been of amber grease 
collecting anxiously small loads of clay less than what building swallows bear away or than those pills which sordid beetles roll transfusing into them their dunghill soul how did they rivet with gigantic piles through the centre their new cached miles and to the stake a struggling country bound where barking waves still bait the forced ground building their watery babel far more high to reach the sea than those to scale the sky yet still his claim the injured ocean laid and off at leapfrog o'er their steeples played as if on purpose it on land had come to show them what's their mere librium a daily deluge over them does boil the earth and water play at level coil the fish oft times the burger dispossessed and sat not as meat but as a guest and oft the tritons and the sea nymphs saw whole shoals of dutch served up for the calabao or as they over the new level ranged for pickled herring pickled heron changed end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Hag by M. Pryor Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver, B.C. While with labor assiduous do pleasure I mix, And in one day atone for the business of six. In a little Dutch chaise on a Saturday night, On my left hand my Horace, a nymph on my right, no memoirs to compose and no postboy to move that on sunday may hinder the softness of love for her neither visits nor parties at tea nor the long-winded cant of a dull refugee this night and the next shall be hers shall be mine to good or ill fortune the third we resign thus scorning the world and superior to fate I drive in my car in professional state. So with Phia through Athens Pisatrasius rode, Men thought her Minerva and him a new god. But why should I stories of Athens rehearse, Where people knew love and were partial to verse, Since none can with justice my pleasures oppose, In Holland half drowned in interest and prose? By Greece and past ages what need I be tried, When the Hague and the present are both on my side? And is it enough for the joys of the day, To think what Anacheron or Sappho would say? When good Vander goes and his provident vrouw, As they gaze on my triumph do freely allow, That search all the province you'll find no man dar is so blessed as the englishman here secretary is end of poem this recording is in the public domain rotterdam by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by recording person rotterdam i gaze upon a city a city new and strange down many a watery vista my fancy takes a range from side to side I saunter, and wonder where I am. And can you be in England, and I at Rotterdam? Before me lie dark waters, and broad canals and deep, Where on the silver moonbeams sleep restless in their sleep. A sort of vulgar Venice reminds me where I am. Yes, yes, you're in England, and I am at Rotterdam. Tall houses with quaint gables, where frequent windows shine, And keys that lead to bridges, and trees in formal line, and masts of spicy vessels from distant Suriname, and tell me you're in England, and I'm in Rotterdam. Those sailors, how outlandish, the face and garb of each, they deal in foreign gestures, and use a foreign speech, a tongue not learned near Isis, or studied by the cam, 
declares that you're in England, but I'm at Rotterdam. And now across a market, my doubtful way I trace, where stands a solemn statue, the genius of the place, and to the great Erasmus I offer my salam, who tells me you're in England, and I'm at Rotterdam. The coffee room is open, I mingle in its crowd, the dominoes are rattling, the hookers raise a cloud. A flavour none of Ferron's, that mingles with my dram, reminds me you're in England, but I'm in Rotterdam. Then here it goes, a bumper, the toast it shall be mine, in Scheidem or in Sherry, Tokay or Hook of Rhine. It well deserves the brightest, where sunbeam ever swam, the girl I love in England, I drink at Rotterdam. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Progress of Error by William Cowper. Read for LibriVox.org by William Demick. The Progress of Error. No plainer truth appears, our most important are our earliest years. The mind, impressible and soft, with ease imbibes and copies what she hears and sees, and through life's labyrinth holds fast the clue that education gives her, false or true. Plants raised with tenderness are seldom strong. Man's cultish disposition asks the thong, and without discipline the favorite child, like a neglected forester, runs wild. But we, as if good qualities would grow spontaneous, take but little pains to sow. We give some Latin, and a smatch of Greek, teach him to fence and figure twice a week, and having done, we think, the best we can, praise his proficiency, and dub him man. From school to Cam or Isis, and thence home, and thence with all convenient speed to Rome, with reverend tutor, clad in habit lay, to tease for cash and quarrel with all day, with memorandum book for every town, and every post, and where the chaise broke down, his stock, a few French phrases got by heart, with much to learn, but nothing to impart, the youth, obedient to his sire's commands, sets off a wanderer into foreign lands. Surprised at all they meet, the gosling pair, with awkward gait, stretched neck, and silly stare, discover huge cathedrals, built with stone, and steeples towering high, much like our own, but show peculiar light by many a grin at popish practices observed within. Ere long, some bowing, smirking, smart abbe, remarks two loiterers that have lost their way and, being always primed with politesse, for men of their appearance and address, with much compassion undertakes the task to tell them, more than they have wit to ask, points to inscriptions, wheresoever they tread, such as, when legible, were never read, but, being cankered now and half-worn out, craze antiquarian brains with endless doubt. Some heedless hero, or some Caesar shows, defective only in his Roman nose, exhibits elevations, drawings, plans, models of Herculanean pots and pans, and sells them medals, which, if neither rare nor ancient, will be so, preserved with care. Strange the recital, from whatever cause his great improvement and new lights he draws, the squire, once bashful, is shame-faced no more, but teems with powers he never felt before. Whether increased momentum, and the force with which from climb to climb he sped his course, as axles sometimes kindle as they go, chafed him, and brought dull nature to a glow, or whether clearer skies and softer air that make Italian flowers so sweet and fair, freshening his lazy spirits as he ran, unfolded genially, and spread the man. Returning, he proclaims, by many a grace, by shrugs, and strange contortions of his face, how much a dunce that has been sent to Rome, excels a dunce that has been kept at home. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Advice Against Travel by J. C. Mangan. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Traverse not the globe for lore. The sternest but the surest teacher is the heart. Studying that and that alone, thou learnest best and soonest whence and what thou art. Time, not travel, tis which gives us ready speech, experience, prudence, tact, and wit. Far more light the lamp that biteth steady than the wandering lantern doth emit. Moor, Chinese, Egyptian, Russian, Roman, tread one common downhill path of doom. Everywhere the names are man and woman, everywhere the old sad sins find room. Evil angels tempt us in all places. What but sands or snows hath earth to give? Dream not, friend, of deserts and oases, but look inwards and begin to live. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Had Cain Been Scott by John Cleveland Read for LibriVox.org by William Demick Had Cain Been Scott Had Cain Been Scott, God would have changed his doom, not forced him wander, but confined him home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Song of the Road by R. L. Stevenson, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The gauger walked with willing foot, and I, the gauger, played the flute. And what should Master Gauger play but over the hills and far away? Whene'er I buckle on my pack and foot it gaily in the track, O pleasant gauger, long since dead, I hear you fluting on ahead. You go with me the self same way, the self same air for me you play, for I do think, and so do you, it is the tune to travel to. For who would gravely set his face to go to this or t'other place? There's nothing under heaven so blue that's fairly worth the travelling to. On every hand the roads begin, and people walk with zeal therein, but whosoe'er the highways tend, be sure there's nothing at the end. Then follow you wherever high the travelling mountains of the sky, or let the streams in civil mode direct your choice upon a road. For one and all, or high or low, will lead you where you wish to go, and one and all go night and day o'er the hills and far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of poems on travel compiled by R. M. Leonard.